1B reflex. The 1B reflex is, um, is, is pretty straightforward. It's a, instead of a, being a monosynaptic reflex, one synapse, the stretch reflex is the only monosynaptic reflex. Uh, the 1B reflex is a disynaptic reflex. And there are a few disynaptic reflexes. We've already looked at one, which is the vestibular ocular reflex. Um, and there are a few others. The, there's a reflex that I studied when I was a graduate student called the jaw opening reflex. If you bite onto something and your tooth breaks, your jaw opens. And that's a disynaptic reflex. So there are a few disynaptic reflexes. There's only one monosynaptic reflex. And the monosynaptic reflex, the only monosynaptic reflex that exists is a stretch reflex. OK, so this is disynaptic reflex. And the information does not come from the muscle spindles. It does not come from the interfusal fibers. Instead, it comes from these 1B afferents, which are wrapped around the, the, uh, the, the their Golgi, Golgi tendon organs that are wrapped around the insertion, the, the, the attachment of the muscle. Um, and so during an active contraction, these 1B afferents are excited. So this is really different. In the stretch reflex, it's a passive load that excites the stretch reflex. In the 1B reflex, it's active excitement, active excitement of a muscle that engages the 1B reflex. And then what's the, what's the result of that? Well, the result of that is to inhibit the same muscle. So you're inhibiting the motor neuron that goes to the same muscle. It goes through an inhibitory interneuron, which is probably the same as the 1A inhibitory interneuron. Um, so this neuron, this 1B afferent, comes in. It synapses on an inhibitory interneuron, which then synapses on an alpha motor neuron that goes to the homonymous muscle. And so that's really weird. So it's as though you're, you're contracting a muscle, and as, as you contract it, you actually have this method for relaxing the contraction. Um, and if this is, if this is, is uh, imagine that, w that you lose this inhibition. If you lose this inhibition, then this muscle is contracted. When you contract it, it gets, it gets contracted as, as hard as you possibly can. There are no limits to the contraction. And that is the situation that occurs during, uh, in, in tetanus. A person that is infected with or affected by the tetanus toxin will go into tetanus. And, and you've seen a picture of this uh, in the epistotonus uh, or in the uh, neural signaling uh, section of this course. And what this looks like is a person who is, has an arched back and is sitting on the heels of their of their feet and on the vertex of their head. And their, their head is back and their jaw is clenched. Every postural, every physiological extensor is contracted as hard as possible. What's the problem with that? Well, it's extremely painful. And it is such a strong contraction that it can break bones. And so the 1B reflex is it opposes that, doesn't let that happen, thankfully. So um, that's one sort of easy reason why we have the 1B reflex, is so that we don't allow this runaway regenerative contraction of agonist muscles, that once you start to contract it, that you can't go all the way. You, you come back down from the, from the top level. Um, and the other place where the 1B reflex is really useful is uh, in, in order to, to make very controlled movements. And, and so, for example, if you're trying to thread a needle, so as you're threading a needle, you need really fine control. You want to you wanna move, but you want it to be a controlled movement. You don't want it to be that fast ballistic movement. You want it to be a controlled. So you want to put the brakes on it Just as much as you want to make the movement propel forward, you also want to put the brakes. And that's what the 1B reflex can do. OK, so that's the 1B reflex. And now we're going to move on to the withdrawal reflex.